Everyone knows who Woody is. I've made several videos on this channel about this dude, both before and after his skill tree. Long story short, he used to kinda suck, but now he's good. Why is he good? Well, there are several reasons, but in the end, it really boils down to the tree guard idol and the moose. The tree guard idols arguably make Woody a better source of living logs than Wormwood, but it also lets you cheese some of the toughest bosses in the game. The moose, well, there used to be a lot of problems with him. You could do some cool stuff like become almost invincible if you had a Wakeford on your team, but by himself? In 9 out of 10 situations, you were better off just fighting bosses in your human form. It's not that the moose's upsides were bad, it's just that it didn't come close to making up for its downside of not being able to heal itself or use items. After the skill tree, the moose has so much more going for him now that I can confidently say that unless I'm swimming in top tier resources, I'd rather be the moose than Woody. If you're interested in learning about rushing bosses as the moose, then stick around as I go over how to be an S tier Woody. Before we get into the run, let's go over the skill tree. Since this is an advanced character guide, I'm going to assume you know the basics of Woody's character. If you don't, then others like Beard, Poxar, and Jakey have covered it. Speaking of Jakey, if you're watching my DSD content, then there's no way you don't know who Jakey is. In Jakey's Ultimate Woody Character Guide, he said that this is what his ideal Woody skill tree perks would be, and in my opinion, he's exactly right. If you're going to be bossing with the moose, you want all the transformation timer skills, because these will maximize the time you can maintain the Weremoose form. Curse Embracer is a must-have, since you won't be getting hit for 20 HP and 15 sanity every time you eat an idol. I don't want any of the Werebeaver perks, because Woody is already really fast at getting wood, and if I want to mine hard substances, I'll just get a pickaxe from the ruins. I definitely want all the Weremoose skills since the regeneration, increased speed, increased damage, and charge cancelling makes the Weremoose incomparably better than he is without it. I don't need any of the Weregoose perks, since I'm not doing any ocean exploration, and for land exploration, Beefalo are better than the Goose in almost every way. The Quick Picker skills let you pick grass and twigs faster, which is nice, but they just pale in comparison to the other stuff that Woody has at his disposal. Crafting boards more efficiently doesn't really matter since Woody can get wood really quickly, but the hardwood hat and walking sticks are great armor and speed boosts when it comes to the first couple of days. The tree guard idol skills are there simply because we want to abuse these guys to fight one boss in particular. I'm generally against cheesing bosses, however I make exceptions when the boss fight is either extremely annoying or is impossible to do if you're trying to use the character's special perks. Lastly, the Shadow Wrangler skill is just way better than the Lunar one, because it basically makes sanity a complete non-issue, at least while I'm in Wereform. And that's why I think this is the ideal boss rushing skill tree, at least if we're talking non-ocean. If I were to include Crab King and Celestial Champion, then I'd probably swap either the Hardwood Hat or the Walking Stick for the first Wear Goose perk, since it greatly increases the Goose's speed. Anyways, like I always say at the start of the run, we're going to have to tame a Beefalo, not only because you'd be crazy to try and move the Suspicious Marble without them, but the sheer mobility and storage capacity they grant you is simply too good to pass up. Of course, I won't be fighting any bosses on the Beefalo, because that would just be an insult to the Moose. So like usual, after spawning in, I collect a bunch of grass, twigs, and at least 3 flint. After that, I head to the mosaic biome, and mine a bunch of rocks. I need to get at least 11 gold, since that's enough for me to craft an alchemy engine, beefalo bell, and saddle. After I have enough materials, I venture off in search of the beefalo. They're either in the beefalo savanna, which is a biome that's 90% savanna turf and 10% forest, or they're in the small patch of savanna that always spawns in the mandrake forest. After finding the beefalo, I bind one to the beefalo bell and start feeding it. I like to tame my beefalo purely by keeping it fed for the first day, because if I try to saddle it immediately, it kicks me off in just 15 seconds of riding. When night falls, I go back to the beefalo herd and shave two of them to obtain the four beefalo wool that I'll need for the saddle. The next day I hammer a few pig houses mainly to get pigskin, and then I start setting up my base in the middle of the magic forest. Once the alchemy engine was set up, I crafted the saddle and started exploring the map at beefalo speed. I usually craft a football helmet at this point, but since I have beefalo armor for traveling, and I'll be using the moose against all the big threats, the hardwood hat is more than sufficient protection for the rest of the run. While exploring the map, I'm looking out for the suspicious marble and the shallow chest set piece. Mandric Forest was located right next to Pig King, so I basically already have the pan flute. In order to fight the twins, I'll need to get the terrarium. Finally, I'll need to get a bunch of living logs in order to craft tree guard idols. It would also be beneficial to find a spot on the map that can give me a lot of monster meat. Since I'll be using at least one moose idol per boss in the run, I'll need at least 30 monster meat for transformations alone. Luckily, this world had a spider quarry located pretty close to spawn, so this is the place that I'll be coming back to a few times throughout the run. I was also lucky with the chest pieces, since the second shadow chest set piece spawned on this map, which meant there were at least double the suspicious marble which made finding one of each a whole lot easier. I ended up finding the set piece in the dragonfly desert, which is really good since I can go to dragonfly right after the shadow chest pieces. Since there were so many suspicious marble on the map, all the pieces were assembled by the beginning of day 8. After that, I spent the rest of the day exploring more of the mosaic and prepping food reserves for my cave exploration. After that, I picked up the terrarium, built a birdcage and crockpots, 
cooked food for both me and my beefalo, and headed to the spider quarry to get most of the idols I'll need for the run. Woody is one of the best characters for farming spiders. All I need to do is transform into the Were-Moose and charge back and forth in a line. Since the moose has such high defenses, each spider is only doing 2 damage per hit, which is easily negated by the regeneration perk. It is possible for the moose to get stunlocked if enough spiders are attacking him at once, so I aim my charges so that they don't end in the middle of a swarm. Another thing that I need to be aware of are spiders eating monster meat. Since the moose can't pick up anything, I need to stop spiders from eating their fallen comrades until I untransform. So I just keep killing spiders until none of them are left, untransform and pick up as much meat as I can. I end up walking away with 24 monster meat, enough for 8 idols. I also get a bunch of silk so I can craft the piggyback. The piggyback has 4 more inventory slots than the backpack and is also waterproof and fireproof. The only downside to this item is that it decreases the wearer's movement speed by 10%. However, that downside is completely negated while Woody is in his wear forms or while he's riding a beefalo. So for me, the piggyback is simply better than the backpack in every way. After I get the piggyback, I make a wooden gate for void walking, a golden axe and pickaxe for the pickaxe, and head to the cave. Like all my other runs, I have three objectives while in the caves. The first is to rush the ruins, the second is to obtain eight fossil fragments, and the third is to find toadstool. Since I'm playing Woody, I have one more goal on top of that, which is locate the atrium and set up the fuel weaver fight. So after running around from biome to biome, I eventually find the wilds. Not long after that I find the ruins and a broken pseudoscience station. Since I'll be fighting everything as the were-moose, I don't really need any armor or weaponry for this run. I don't even need a magi since the moose can't use any of that. The only thing I need from here are the ancient key, a star collar staff, and a whole lot of nightmare fuel. There's a good chance that AG will give me a staff, but when it comes to fuel, Woody might be the best character for getting this stuff during nightmare phase. Not only is the moose really good at fighting nightmare creatures, but the charge ties in with Weber as the best character for farming shadow spell monkeys. Depending on how well you position the monkeys, it's possible for Woody to farm an unlimited amount of these without taking any damage. So I spend nightmare phase farming monkeys while killing dangling depth dwellers and depth worms from time to time. I don't think I even pick up all the loot, but I still end up walking away with 37 cave bananas and 24 nightmare fuel. After that I head to AG. I use the Thulocyte medallion that I made earlier to reveal his location on the map, and then I head on over. Once I found him in the labyrinth, I fed my beefalo a steam twig or two, put it away and transformed into the were-moose to start the fight. The moose is so good that fighting the AG with it is arguably easier than fighting it with Wigfrid. One of the biggest factors in the AG fight is lack of light. Sure, the arena initially will be lit up by light bulbs, but these will eventually dim out, which leaves the player in total darkness. The typical way to combat this is to make a dwarf star in the arena or wear a magi, but the moose is just way better since he has complete night vision. This night vision makes it really easy to see where AG and all the obstacles are so I can plan my next move and where the shadow tentacles spawn so I know where to avoid. Another thing that players typically need to contend with is insanity. However, since I have the Shadow Wrangler skill, it makes absolutely no difference if I go insane since nightmare creatures will remain passive to me while I'm in wear form. As for weapons, the Wermoose is dealing handbat damage with his normal punches, but due to the Wermoose mastery, he's also doing a Hulk smash on every third hit. This smash is doing an insane 136 damage, which is the equivalent of 2 hits from a Dark Sword. So the Wermoose is on average doing 85 damage per hit, which means he's hitting about as hard as Wigfrid. Lastly, the 90% damage reduction gives even better defenses than Wigfrid if she's using standard battle helms, and the Wermoose 2 perk gives him regeneration. In conclusion, it's a really easy fight, but not boring easy. In Phase 2, the Ancient Guardian starts to spawn Shadow Tentacles and jump at me. The jumps are easy to avoid. All I do is run in the opposite direction of where I was going when he initiates the jump. Avoiding tentacles are easy because I can see so well, but I think I still get hit since my super high defenses and regeneration allows me to take risks in order to deal more damage. After the Ancient Guardian is dead, I loot his chest. Unfortunately, there's no Star Caller, but I did get a Lazy Explorer, which is something I forgot to mention I'll need for Fuel Weaver. So I grab the loot and head back to the station to make a Star Caller. I also make a couple of crowns just because it makes the run more comfortable and the pickaxe for the Nightmare Were Pig. Before I completely head out of the ruins, I locate the Atrium Bridge and cheat myself into the Void. From here, I find the Arena and teleport in. There's a good chance you know what I'm doing here, but if not, don't worry, I'll explain at the very end of the run. I plant a bunch of pine cones on one side of the arena and build as many tree guard idols as I can. Unfortunately, I run out of grass, so I'm only able to make two right now. After that, I drop the idols and the ancient key and cheat back into the void. With all my ruins objectives done, I just need to locate Toadstool and get the eight fossil fragments. Getting the fossil fragments was as easy as it normally is. Once I found the splagmite biome, I destroyed a bunch of spider dens until I had all eight. Finding Toadstool was pretty difficult. There are a total of three arenas, and Toadstool can be at any one of them. Usually one of the Toadstool spawners will be in the muddy biome, another in the green mushroom forest, and another in the rock lobster biome. But rock lobster didn't have one. 
Eventually I found the last one attached to the splagmite biome. With that I'm done in the caves and I was back at the surface on day 18. Since I had a few days before winter starts, I had enough time to fight Dragonfly before day 21. So after making a bunch of steam twigs, a thermal stone and some food, I headed to the Dragonfly fight. Before the fight, I make the typical setup which is 12 walls built corner to corner off of each side of the furthest lava pond. In addition to that, I build a punching bag a little off center and not too close to the lava pond. After I'm done with that, I feed my beefalo 3 steam twigs because this fight is going to take around an entire game day. After feeding it, I put it far away from the arena, I transform into the moose and start punching Dragonfly. Out of all the bosses I'll be fighting in this run, Dragonfly is by far the hardest. It's not that she hits hard. With the moose's 90% natural armor, she's only dealing 7.5 damage per slap, and the moose completely heals that in 25 seconds. It's not that she's really hard to dodge. The moose can reliably dodge her after getting 6 hits in, if I'm animation cancelling. No, the thing that makes Dragonfly tough is that unless I transform back into Woody after every cycle, or abuse an Ice Flingo setup, I have no way of stopping Dragonfly from enraging. So for phase 1, I just hit Dragonfly 6 times and dodge while animation cancelling the ground smashes. Animation cancelling the ground smashes is really important, as it gives you just enough extra time to run out of Dragonfly's slap range. After her HP dips below 22,500, Dragonfly goes to spawn lava. I immediately head to the outside of the arena and start hitting the punching bag. The purpose of the punching bag is to stop the moose's wariness from draining. If the moose hasn't punched something for some time, the wariness will begin to drain more rapidly. This isn't so bad at first, but the maximum drain can get up to almost 10 wariness per second. So I punch the bag so I can stay in wear moose as long as possible. One important thing to keep in mind is that the punching bag is flammable, so I don't build it too close to the lava pond and make sure both lava and enraged dragonfly never gets near it because the moose can't punch it if it's burnt. After Dragonfly is done spawning, she comes back and I re-engage her with the same cutting pattern. Since the lava's pathing doesn't recognize the lava ponds as obstacles, they get stuck on the ponds until they explode. Once the last lava explodes, Dragonfly will either go back to spawn more or enrage. If she goes back to spawn more, I just go back to the punching bag and wait for her to return. If Dragonfly enrages, then it's go time. Unfortunately, I severely mess up on kiting her during this first enrage. Mistake number one is that I tried to charge away while she did her triple stomp attack. Instead, I should have continued walking and then charged away. The first mistake sort of messed up my kiting, so I ended up not charging early enough or charging at bad angles. Because of all this, I get hit a bunch by an enemy that's dealing 150 damage per slap. Eventually, I pull it together and start kiting her well. The reason I relocated the fight to the center of the arena is simply because there's more space to move around. After her health drops below half, she comes down and goes back to spawning lava. When she does this, I go back and untransform, restore my health with two pierogies, and turn back into the moose again. The next time she enrages, I fight her like how you're supposed to. I avoid her triple stomp attack and then charge towards the center of the arena. Enraged only lasts for a minute, so I charge again to try and waste more time. Once she catches up to me, I take a hit and do a 3 hit combo and then immediately charge to the side to avoid the slap. Charging to the side lets you both dodge her strike and get a free hit on her. So it's 2 punches and a charge to the side until she double stomps. When she double stomps, just run away to waste more of the enrage timer until she catches up to you. Once her health dips to 20%, she starts to spawn lava again. After basically a day of fighting and two moose idols, Dragonfly is dead. 
It's day 21, so it's time to fight the shadow pieces. Fortunately, the set piece is in the Dragonflight Desert, so I have more than enough time to feed my beef flow, put it away, and get to the fight before night. Once night falls, I do not mine the pieces. Instead, I transform into the moose and ram into the night to start the fight. We're actually not going to do the pieces in the usual order. Although the moose's charge cancelling makes fighting the level 3 shadow rope very viable, the fight goes by much faster if you leave the bishop for last. So I try my best to land as many hits on the knight while using my charge to avoid the rook and bishop. Once the knight is dead, both pieces level up to 2. I focus my fire on the rook while using the charge to dodge both of their attacks. It's possible to avoid the rook completely, but not the bishop. However, the bishop attacks so infrequently, and the moose is moving so fast, that I'm taking less than 4 damage every time the bishop teleports, and this damage is completely healed by the time it attacks again. After the rook is defeated, the bishop levels up to 3. Beating it is really simple. All I do is attack it while it's vulnerable, and right when it begins to teleport, I just charge away. It's impossible for the moose to avoid getting hit, but I'm only taking 6 damage per teleport, and most of this damage is healed up by the time I have to dodge again. Unlike the rook, the bishop stays vulnerable for a much longer time, and has a lot less HP, so fighting the bishop simply takes way less time than fighting the rook. When the bishop is defeated, I still have over half my awareness, and I am at almost full HP. Since it's day 22, Klaus's loot stash hasn't spawned yet, and the knights are not long enough to fight the twins, so I go down to the caves to fight Toadstool. Now there's a good chance that you know about the Toadstool tree guard method. I'm not sure who came up with it, but the first time I saw it was from a YouTuber called JJ. Basically, you plant a bunch of trees in the Toadstool arena and one by Toadstool. After the tree is fully mature, you light a stack of Woody's tree guard idols, turning them into tree guards. Then you use the pan flute to make them lose aggro, activate toadstool, and make toadstool walk over the single tree. Doing that aggro's all the tree guards onto toad. Depending on how many tree guards you've got, the fight is over in like a minute. It's really good, really cool, but it's also cheese. Now I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with cheesing raid bosses. However, I personally would only do it if I'm trying to break a speedrun world record, or if the fight is nearly impossible or extremely impractical otherwise. The thing is that the Wermoose is really good against Toadstool. So although the tree guard method is cool, I have a lot more fun and sense of accomplishment by beating it in an actual head-to-head -head battle. The way I fight Toadstool in this run isn't the ideal way to beat this boss with the Moose. The most practical way is to fight Toadstool as human Woody first, and then transform into the Moose once the first set of spore caps have been chopped down. I forgot to bring the pan flute and I didn't have a weapon, so I'm doing a 100% Wermoose fight, which is still very viable, just not the most optimal in my opinion. So after getting to the correct Toadstool spawner, I put my beefalo away in the corner, and then chop the Toadstool cap to start the fight. Right after that, I eat an idol and start punching Toad as the moose. Toadstool has an enormous health pool, so this fight is going to take a while. In phase 1 and 2, he has two moves. The first is to drop a volley of boom shrooms that explode after a couple of seconds. The second is to plant a spore bomb on your head that will turn into a spore cloud. The spore cloud spoils perishables really quickly. Because of this, people often don't use handbats against Toadstool, which makes the fight a lot more expensive. Since the Wermoose's weapons are his fists, he doesn't have to worry about weapon spoilage, which is one reason why the moose is great against Toadstool. This fight is all about positioning. As I fight Toadstool, I lead him towards the outside of the closest pond to the center of the arena. After 45 seconds, Toadstool will begin to walk back. During this time, he'll completely ignore you, so you can do a ton of damage. After 15 seconds, Toadstool will then begin to summon spore caps. The spore caps power Toadstool up, depending on how many are spawned in. It takes 10 swings from regular axe to fell one of these. This means that normal characters take a long time to chop all the spore caps down. So long, in fact, that by the time they are finished, Toadstool will be just about ready to spawn more. The Wormoose doesn't have this problem. The Wormoose's charge does the equivalent of 8 chops with an axe, meaning I can take out a tree in just 2 charges. Not only that, but Wormoose 3 lets me cancel my charges if I miss, and it reduces the drowsiness that the Wormoose experiences after the charge to the point that it's almost non-existent. So I destroy all the trees and fight Toadstool again while constantly trying to position Toad behind that pond. Of course since this is DST, I get a Depth Worm attack right after I start the fight, so I have to waste a bunch of time dealing with these two idiots. After the interview,
interference is dealt with. I get back to dealing with Toad. Since I had to fight the worms, most of the cycle is spent destroying the trees. It's important to note that while I destroy the trees, I'm making sure to either punch Toadstool or get hit from time to time, because both actions will keep my awareness from rapidly draining. Spore Clouds only deal 2 damage to the moose, so these are a great way of stopping my awareness from draining if Toadstool isn't near. I got hit a bunch, but by playing a little cautiously, I'm able to regain most of my HP back from the moose's passive regeneration. When Toadstool spawns spore caps, I don't want to immediately destroy them. Instead, I continue to attack Toadstool until 5 of them are up. This way I can do a lot of free damage to Toad, and I don't have to risk standing around and waiting for them to spawn, so I can charge them again. Also, the order in which I charge these matters. My rule of thumb is to start charging the ones closest to the center of the arena, and then work my way either clockwise or counterclockwise, so that the last spore caps I charge are in the direction that I want Toadstool to move to. So if Toadstool is too far to the left of the pond, the last trees that I charge will be on the right of the pond, and vice versa. When my awareness gets to around 5, I position myself so that I'm on the opposite side of the pond of Toadstool. This way I can untransform and transform back into the moose without getting killed. I also take the time to use some of the healing salves that I got from the terrarium chest. These aren't necessary because, like I mentioned before, if I want to recover health, I'll just play a little passively. However, the salves restore my HP, which lets me play more aggressive, which in turn shortens the duration of the fight. Once Toadstool enters phase 3, it starts to do its double stomp attack. This is both a good and bad thing. It's good because the falling minerals will reset the awareness drain and deals almost no damage. It's bad because the double stomp attack is more annoying to avoid than the boom shrooms, especially if the moose is groggy after charging a tree. So phase 3 just requires a little more caution than the previous phases. Since this is such a long fight, it's almost inevitable that Woody will go insane. The Shadow Wrangler skill not only makes this a non-factor, but it gives me a bunch of free Nightmare fuel since the Nightmares will be getting hit by Toadstool's attacks. The problem is that the Nightmares will aggro onto me after I transform back into Woody. The solution is to exit the fight a little earlier and kill the passive Nightmare creatures while keeping Toadstool positioned on the outside of the pond. Not only does this get rid of the threats, but it also gives me enough sanity to not be insane. Once the transformed, I eat another idol and start smacking again.
after a fight that lasts almost two days, Toadstool drops dead. With Toadstool gone, I kill the passive nightmare creatures before turning back into Woody, grab the food, get my beefalo, and head back to the surface. It's now well past day 23, which means Klaus's loot stash has definitely spawned. After getting the antler from the no idea and searching for an entire day, I finally find the loot stash in the mosaic biome. I don't need any special preparations, so after putting the beefalo away, I insert the deer antler into the loot stash to summon Klaus. Of all the raid bosses in DST, Klaus is definitely the moose's best matchup, and it's for two reasons. The first is the moose's 90% natural armor applies to all types of damage. This includes fire and freezing. Normal characters will try to avoid the fire spell since it damages them right through their armor. However, since the moose's natural armor is so high, he can straight up ignore the fire spell, because it does almost nothing to it. What little damage the fire spell does is healed up in no time by the moose's passive regeneration. The second reason the moose is great against Klaus is its charge attack. Regular characters want to dodge the ice spell the moment it is cast, since it slows them down making it harder to dodge. If you're the moose, you want to continue to punch Klaus right until the deer is ready to cast the ice spell, and then charge to the other side of Klaus. The moose's charge is completely unaffected by the slowdown effect of the spell, and the moose will deal extra damage to Klaus when it hits him with the charge. Since I'm using the charge so much in the fight, it's best to chop down all the trees and mine all the boulders around the arena prior to summoning Klaus, since running into these things can cause you to be in a really bad position. I didn't do this, so I had to work around these obstacles during the fight. Phase 2, Klaus gets revived at 5000 HP and gains his pounce attack. The moose is once again great at this fight since the pounce can be easily dodged with a charge attack. When Klaus is ready to pounce, simply charge in the opposite direction of him. The moose is moving at 200% movement speed while charging, so there's no way that Klaus's pounce will hit him if the moose is on the move. After a short but fun fight, Klaus is dead and I get rewarded with a Krampus sack. Remember when I said that some bosses are so annoying or impractical that I would rather cheese them than fight them legit? Well, Bee Queen is one of them, when it comes to Woody. There is a way to beat Bee Queen with the Wermoose. From what I've seen, Taco's Lord has the best strat for it. However, I didn't feel like setting everything up and then having to fight Bee Queen for over 10 minutes while hopping in and out of transformations to heal myself. I think the last part is really what I don't like. Having to waste a bunch of transformations is a big turnoff for me. However, you should watch Taco's Lord's video because, to my knowledge, it's the best way of doing this fight legit. I always could just fight Bee Queen the normal way. However, that's really resource intense and I would basically be playing the game as Wilson. Since I'm not going to be doing it legit, instead I'll be cheesing Bee Queen with the twins. This isn't a strategy that's specific to Woody. Literally any character can do it. All you need to do is bring the twins to phase 2, preferably by decreasing both of their health below 6500. Then on one of the longest winter nights, activate the terrarium, hammer Bee Queen's hive to summon her, put her to sleep and hang out by her until the twins spawn in. Then run away as soon as you see them. The twins will aggro onto Bee Queen and start to devastate her and all her minions with their chain charge attacks. Each charge does over 200 damage to mobs, which means all the grumble bees instantly die, and Bee Queen can take over 1000 damage each time the twins decide to do a volley. Stay close enough so the fight is on screen, but not too close that the twins or Bee Queen notice you. This is really easy to do with a Rider Beefalo. Another way is to get a bush hat and hide near the fight, although getting hit by a stray twin charge can mess everything up. That's pretty much all there is to it. Sit back and let the twins kill Bee Queen. After she dies, just wait until day to collect the loot. Jelly Beans used to be an incredible buff for the Weremoose, since it gave the Moose almost 120 more HP per transformation. However, the only remaining raid boss that we're going to be fighting with the Moose are the Twins, and Jelly Beans aren't really necessary to win. They do make the fight easier though. So I activate the Terrarium on the next night. I pamphlet both Twins, transform into the Moose, and lead Retinazer away from Spasmatism. Then it's just a 1 vs 1 fight. I tried to combat Retinazer in an open field, but we ended up being around a bunch of trees. Remember when I said that as Woody, whenever you fight a boss, you should chop down all the trees in the area? Well now you can see why. Since the Weremoose can't equip any items, I'm just moving at default speed. 
Default speed is enough to dodge the twins, however the window for error is tight, which means if I have to move around a tree, it's possible that the slight detour will get me hit. So yeah, don't fight the twins in a forest, especially if you're using the moose. After getting hit a bunch, I beat Red Nazer with about 100 HP and then move on to Spasmatism. Deerclops had spawned right by Spasmatism and the two were fighting off screen. Deerclops was getting destroyed and by the time I got there, it was basically dead. I started fighting Spaz and everything was going pretty well until the fight got moved to the forest again. Then I got hit a bunch because this guy's charges are way less forgiving than Retinazers. In the end, I managed to take him down, but yeah, please fight these guys in an open area if you're using the moves. With the twins dead, there's two more bosses to beat, and both are in the caves. I spend the next day preparing the stuff I'll need for both of them. For the Nightmare Were Pig, all I really need is the pickaxe to vibrate the pillars, and one moose idol. For Fuel Weaver, I'll need the 8 fossil fragments, the Lazy Explorer, some sandy food, and more tree guard idols. I pretty much have all that stuff, so most of my prep was just making jelly beans for extra heals and food so I don't starve to death. I already found the Nightmare Were Pig earlier, so after heading to the caves, I chopped the tree for a pine cone and headed to the pig. Once there, I made a star put my beefalo away, freed the pig by vibrating the pillars, killed the shadelings, and went moose. The moose is a really good matchup for the Nightmare Warrior Pig. First off, night vision is always a big plus when fighting in the caves. This boss is famous for being able to knock the player down. However, the moose is completely immune to this mechanic, so he can actually punch right through the Warrior Pig's body slams. The moose is also completely unaffected by the craters that the Warrior Pig creates in phase 2, which makes the fight again way easier. Probably my favorite thing about the moose in this fight is Shadow Wrangler. The Nightmare Were Pig has an extremely strong Insani Aura, but it's irrelevant to the Moose, since Shadow Wrangler makes all Nightmares passive to him. With all of that, plus infinite 90% armor, HP regeneration, and good DPS, the Nightmare Were Pig doesn't stand a chance. After the pig is beaten, I use the blueprints that he drops to restore my sanity and I start heading towards the atrium. The gate I made earlier is still in the ruins, so I use it once again to cheat myself into the void and once I get to the arena, I teleport in. By now the trees I planted earlier should almost be fully grown. This is good because we're going to be killing Fuel Weaver with the tree guard idle cheese method. I'm sorry, but I've tried many times to figure out a way to beat Fuel Weaver with the moose. However, the fight is simply not viable. The problem isn't that I can't use the lazy explorer or the moose can't tank enough, because there is a workaround for those situations. The problem is insanity. Sure, Shadow Wrangler will stop the moose from getting mobbed by nightmares, but it doesn't stop Fuel Weaver from mind controlling the moose. Because of this, even if you perfectly dodge all the bone snares, Fuel Weaver just mind controls you and heals up a ton of HP in phase 2, and there's nothing you can really do. The other way I could fight Fuel Weaver is just fight him as Wilson without weather pains, but that's boring. So although it feels a little cheap to beat Fuel Weaver this way, it's still a pretty cool method, and more importantly, it's a strategy that is unique to Woody. I did not come up with this method. The first time I've seen it was I think from the same guy, JJ, so credit to him if he came up with it. However, this was the first time I did it in a run, so I made two mistakes. First, I forgot to plant the single tree away from the others. This is important because in order for all my tree guards to aggro onto Fuel Weaver, I need to get Fuel Weaver to destroy a normal tree. So I plant the pinecone next to the correct skeleton and wait for it to sprout. The second mistake that I made was forgetting the pan flute. When the tree guard idols are used, all the tree guards will immediately aggro onto you. The way to get them to be neutral is to use the pan flute. I forgot it, so I ended up exiting the game and rejoining to make the trees passive. Anyways, that's pretty much all the hiccups, because once the tree sprouted, I inserted the shadow atrium to summon Fuel Weaver. 
Then I got him to run over the tree which set the horde of tree guards on him. After that I just stood back and watched as Fuever got shredded by over a dozen boss tier enemies. Once he goes into phase 2, I just stay away and destroy the hidden hands. Since the tree guards were taking the heat, I didn't even need a nightmare amulet. I just stayed insane because nothing was going to hurt me except maybe a stray nightmare. After destroying the hands, I just killed whatever woven shadows I could get to and watched as Fuel Weaver was obliterated in just one cycle. And that is, in my opinion, how to be more or less an S tier Woody. We've beaten Dragonfly, the Shadow Pieces, Toadstool, Kloss, the Twins of Terror, and Fuever by day 33, and using abilities that are completely unique to Woody. I left Bee Queen off the list because although she was technically beaten, it was a cheese strat that wasn't specific to this character. Again, if you want to see how it's really done, Sir Tacos Lord's strat is probably the way to go. Anyways, that's the end of the video. Thanks for watching, everyone. Take care and have a great day.